can hear me in the back. Okay, amazing. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I'm gonna be super brief because it's after lunch, uh, but uh, I'm gonna talk uh, about uh, how we're trying to develop machine learning to streamline Bravus analysis uh, and how we are gonna do it right now and right here in this boat on this expedition. And it's amazing for me that I talk right now because we all witnessed how cool it was to develop Bravus this morning. Uh, it was super cool to deploy them, to lose the flag and then to find it again. Uh, but there's so much more cool stuff about Browse. So, for example, the coolest thing for me is that it gives you automatic selfies uh, without you trying to look at it. Uh, and it has amazing things as well. So, uh, for example, looking for rare species that we're going to try to look for in these videos. So. Before I start talking about the work that we do, uh, I just want to give a brief introduction about myself. Um, ever since I was young, uh, I was born in Italy and I've sailed a lot, so I was really connected with the ocean. And then I went to London uh, to study an um, integrated master in computer science and machine learning at Imperial College London. And now I'm trying to join these two sides of myself. And ever since I entered the space of marine science, uh, I felt like, obviously, I was entering it from a quite peculiar and, and different point of view. And I felt from uh, the community some interest uh, in uh, what I was doing, but also, obviously, some skepticism. And uh, I understand and I feel that this skepticism is mainly due to uh, misunderstanding in machine learning and what that actually is. So before talking about Bravs, I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, just sharing what I think machine learning is in the world of ocean science and conservation. Most basically, uh, I definitely do not think it's a chat GPT that you can put and does everything automatically. Um, I simply think is a tool that allows you to do uh, preliminary data analysis, and it does it really fast. The way I can think about it uh, in the world of marine science is think about a volunteer that you can train once, uh, and from then on it works tirelessly, 24-7, uh, to the task that you trained it for. And it's loyal, it's always with you, you don't need to train another volunteer when that one leaves. And I'm gonna so give just a... Like to use this, the clicker? Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> This is in the, in the computer. Ah. Aquí. It's amazing. Sí. Wow. Okay. Bam. Okay. So, just a couple of examples of how it's being deployed uh, in, in, in your world. Uh, um, Monterey Bay Area Aquarium just recently developed an underwater robot that has a camera and it has a little metallic bait, just the one that's used for fishing. And it recorded for hours and hours. Um, and then they use machine learning to extract only the interesting frames. Uh, and then had biologists look at these frames. Uh, and they found jellyfish and they found a white shark as well. Then Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the MIT together deployed uh, uh, a UAV in a coral reef uh, and had an algorithm that automatically detected the species found there and then had scientists uh, compute biodiversity hotspots of this reef. Well, in both these two cases, we can see that these scientists use machine learning uh, only as a preliminary analysis tool, and then use this extract clean data to then perform further analysis. And this is the core power that I think it can have in the world of marine science and conservation. I feel machine learning uh, is, has the huge potential of removing uh, all the boring, uh, tedious work uh, that you end up doing uh, and letting you focus uh, and spend time only on what's meaningful and where your incredible experience uh, can have a huge impact. And I'm a strong, strong, strong believer that um, scientists and conservationists uh, that can start deploying these systems uh, can exponentially grow the impact of their science, uh, their conservation and funding as well because uh, we're we living right now in a really interesting moment where there is a huge hype of machine learning uh, 
and there is a lot of funding into it. And when there is funding in one direction, which can be ChatGPT, for example, this funding spills over other directions, for example, conservation. So one other thing that I'm super, super, super passionate about and excited is that so far it's just starting. So we literally have a blank canvas that we can paint in however way we want. And that allows us to shape machine learning towards the direction of your research, towards what it can be useful for you, and the direction of MPA, which is the, the, the main theme of this summit. So I'm incredibly excited and thankful to James and Monse to letting me be here to have this conversation with you guys and see how can it be shaped in towards the amazing work that each one of you is doing. Okay, so enough about general topics. Uh, I'm gonna start talking about the work that we did uh, for Shark Tracker, which is an algorithm that annotates graphs faster. Basically, it's pretty simple. You have a study that you do with graphs. Huh? That's a hard drive with 500 hours of graphs, imagine. Then you plug it into the PC, and overnight, huh, you run our algorithm. What it does huh, is it detects the shark, but it also tracks it across frames keeping the same ID. Now it loses it, but it keeps another ID. And with doing this, uh, as you can see in this amazing scalloped hammerhead frames, uh, it can track multiple individuals. And then the algorithm uh, extracts uh, one screenshot for each individual that it found, uh, showing the time that it found, the video that it found, and the ID. And this allows scientists to then super quickly put the species uh, of this specific species and then the algorithm reads the manual annotation and boom, creates, generates the max n, which is the metric used by brave scientists. This max n Excel can then be used for further analysis uh, using software like R, but also traditional software like event measure. And all this process runs uh, in the background around half an hour for each hour of footage. And it requires, once it finishes running in the background, so you don't need to do anything, it requires one minute and a half of manual annotation for each hour of video that you have. So what this means, uh, for example, imagine we collect 10 hours today. Overnight, in five hours, we run the video. And then in more or less eight minutes, we have everything annotated. This is amazing, but can we do even better? I got to Pelagios uh, with this algorithm and by just after the first chat with James and Carlos, we were already thinking of how we can extend it. And this is what we explored. So first of all, humans can, can make mistakes, obviously, especially when you have many, many, many individuals. So can we improve the accuracy of the species identification? Well, pelagic studies uh, not only look at sharks, uh, but uh, for example, Migramara looks at tunas and pelagic species. Uh, can we annotate other species? And finally, how about moments in when conditions are really, really bad? For example, this is a nursery in the, the Mogote, in the Bay of La Paz. And here there is a sharp nose, but here there is another one, and the model didn't find it. So can we prove all of this? And this is the work that uh, Carlos and I have been doing uh, this week, uh, which is the development uh, of a specified, uh, localized version of Shark Track uh, for an area. What you do? is basically we have shark track and we have videos of a specific area. In this case, the Revilla Hiedo Archipelago. We put them together and we train a, a localized version of shark track, which is just like a volunteer that's trained on recognizing specific species of an area. And this gives you an algorithm that can work much better in a local area. The benefits of this is that number one, it can classify any species. Uh, we are using it for tunas, uh, we, we found turtles, uh, but you can also extend it to any species that you want, from pelagic to reef species. Secondly, it's twice as fast than the previous one uh, because you don't need to annotate it. It was really funny because when I got to Pelagius, I was like, okay, this model is going to help you greatly. And then we found that in the Reviajedo archipelago, you have something like uh, a thousand individuals for one study, and it was impossible to annotate them all. So this does it incredibly faster. And finally, it can work in difficult conditions. 
So, how is he going to help us? During this trip, uh, you, uh, but you should think about it in two ways. On the field work and when you come back home. During this trip, it's going to give us a, a max and approximation without us doing anything because we won't have any, enough time. So what it does is you collect, we collect graphs uh, like we did this morning. We copy it into the laptop and then overnight we're going to run the model. And tomorrow morning we're going to have an approximation that we're going to share with the team uh, to see what we found and have an overview of uh, the results of the study and also create a field report. Secondly, when we come back to the office, uh, we can take the same exact output uh, and manually have experts uh, that revise all the classification. And this generates the, the final Maxen, uh, the raw data, that can then be integrated uh, in the analysis uh, for a paper or to ask for a marine protected area. This is really interesting, uh, but obviously, uh, how can we trust it? Because it's an algorithm, okay? So the first thing that you should consider is that you always have control. The scientist always has control on the species annotation. And that's the most important thing. The algorithm doesn't do it automatically. It needs manual verification. But we tested it on 200 hours of graphs from three different locations. Huh? And we achieved 89% max and accuracy. These locations were never seen by the model before. That shows how the model can generalize uh, in new areas uh, previously unseen. But an interesting thing came up as well. We found that 6% of the MAXN uh, from these studies uh, were wrong. And these were detections uh, in really, really, really difficult conditions uh, where potentially the analyst uh, that had to look through 500 hours of videos uh, missed the shark. And that shows us uh, an interesting thing. Because machine learning by itself uh, is useless. Humans are much better, obviously. We see it here. But then if you merge them together, the humans can help increase this. Uh, and machine learning can help uh, reduce the human error. So there is a really interesting connection between the two that I think it would be interesting to explore. SharkTrack is now being developed in eight different locations. Um, I would love to talk about it if you're interested, but the main point of this slide uh, is that all of these people are people who have no interest in machine learning whatsoever, and they wouldn't be using it uh, if it's not useful for them. And, uh, and it was really interesting because we developed it with many of these people, so we had the opportunity to iterate with their feedback. So what's next? Um, well, I think what I'm here for is to see, is to find that, that connection between machine learning uh, and ocean science. Uh, I, 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 I strongly believe that it can help you big times, uh, but I don't have the ocean experience, the ocean science experience, uh, to see how it can help. I have some ideas, but I would love if we could all discuss or, or see ways in which machine learning and algorithms like SharkTrack could help your work. I think that for the theme of MPAs, uh, machine learning could greatly help uh, establish them faster and monitor them easier. First part, establish them faster. I remember um, talking to James uh, and he was telling me about his plans of creating a new MPA. And he was telling me how they need to collect more data and analyze it, uh, to have then the reports to ask the government for it. Well, machine learning is amazing at this data processing because it can streamline it big, big times, and we are seeing it. And then monitor easier. With algorithms like this, uh, we can cheaply j go to the field uh, and process this data. And it can allow us to extract trends uh, of multi-years. Uh, for example, with the baseline that Osvaldo was, uh, was mentioning, uh, algorithms like this could be amazing to just drop cameras underwater and then look for what it is. And it doesn't have to be sharks, it can be algae as well. Regarding elasmobranchs uh, and pelagic species in general, uh, maybe a starting point for this discussion uh, could be um, developing, replicating this work that we did for Avilla, but for the whole Eastern Pacific. So imagine, for example, we take all the data that you have uh, 
and we develop specified uh, deployments uh, of Shark Talk. So we can have a Shark Talk Revilla, Shark Talk Co Cocos, Galapagos, Malpelo, and all these algorithms allow you to process graphs faster, but also process visual images uh, for different studies that you might be interested in doing uh, and remove the, the time bottleneck of data analysis. So thank you so much for your time and I just want to take another uh, time the opportunity to thank James, Mauricio, the amazing team of Irene, Fer and Carlos that helped me am amazingly with uh, developing this algorithm. It was an amazing experience uh, and here I'm generally living my dream because like, I'm used to being in a lab on this laptop and here I'm in this amazing place with amazing sights. So thank you so much everyone. Thank you. <laughs>